Number 31 on the field, number one in your heart. Broncos country and the rest of the world. The first episode of KJAC TV from my home. I know you guys used to seeing us in the locker room, but we decided to change up the format a little bit. Gonna make it a little bit more in depth this year. And the first guest, number 31 on the field, number one in your hearts. You no, know I had to have my guy on first, Justin Simmons. How you doing today, my guy? Man, I'm great, man. Appreciate you for having me on the first episode. That's love. That's love. Man. It's always a pleasure to have you on KJAC TV, man. Um, and obviously, you're my guy. Uh, we've been rocking five years now, the duo. So, um, I mean, it was a no-brainer to have you on first. But before we start, we got to start with a little vino. Chef Alexandria, she's going to come out, tell us what we're having today. Chef, if you will, please. All right, gentlemen. We have our domain Emily Byer 2021 Pinot Gris coming from the region of Alice, uh, southeastern part of France. Nice. That sounds fancy, I'm not gonna lie. I'm excited. Always down to have a little wine with my guy and talk about life, talk a little football and everything else. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, appreciate you. All right. All right, my guy, let's get into it. Lessons. All right. Jay, what it do? Let's talk about your childhood a little bit. Uh, growing up in Port St. Lucie, um, how was that? It was good, man. It was good. So uh, I was born in Virginia, moved at a really young age uh, to South Florida. And uh, I'm the oldest of three. Got two younger brothers, Nate and Tristan. And uh, mom was white, dad was black. My dad was from South Florida, so we kind of went back to his neck of the woods, and um, it was it was great. I mean, honestly, he he. So my dad was a big time athlete from around there, and so we'll talk about it as we go throughout the podcast. But a lot of my journey stems from the beginning of moving to Florida because I was already looked at as a as a kid that had to meet expectations because my dad met and hit all those expectations when he moved to South Florida. So Pops was a baller, so baller. naturally everybody had expectations of you being a baller. And I'm sure they're brothers as well. Yeah, this Vic kid, he got to gotta show me something. Got to. Yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what it was. I get it, man. And it's, it's talking about carrying the weight of, of your name. Obviously, Pops coming before you, uh, being a baller. What position did he play? He played safety and running back. Yeah, so another safety and running back yeah. combo um, athlete. So, uh, I mean, obviously you lived up to those expectations, you know, to, to be where you are now. Just kind of just kind of run, run us through so having those expectations and finally getting on the field as a kid or middle school and, and into high school. Um, first of all, how did you feel about that? And secondly, you know, uh, did you feel any you know, pressure from that. Yeah. Nah, I mean, I felt, I always felt uneasy until I actually played. Like there was, you know, there was this heavy, it felt like weight on my shoulders, you know, walking around and I was always nervous all the way up until like the first snap of the game. And then once I was in football, I was just in it. And I think, I think I learned a lot about myself, obviously through the first couple of years, you know, talk about Pop Warner and even, especially going into high school, I learned a lot about myself because all the distractions were just that all the way up until I actually played the game and everything else like didn't matter. It was like football was like an escape. You know how guys have like video games they go to as an escape, they can escape from that. Guys got shows or movies or books. Like for me, when I was growing up, like football was a true escape. Like anything that was happening in the world to me, I could escape from that when I was in, in between the white lines on game day. And that's just the reality of it. My dad did a good job kind of paving, paving that route for me and helping me learn and understand that. But it was crazy because like my dad was a lot like you and how you play. You know what I mean? Like it's reckless, reckless. I mean, first first thing in sight. It's my guy. That's why he's my that was why he's my guy. Yeah, <laughs> reckless. Send him to the upper deck. And then so everyone expected that from me. And I played it. I have I would say probably I have a little bit more finesse to the game. Like I was a ball guy. That's why we that's why we work well together the duo and so i was a ball guy so you know the first few games i was playing well but i was playing different and what I, they're used to seeing yeah, because you're yeah Vic's son. and i think it was cool 
for people it was different, but it was cool for them to see like a different style of play from someone that they're used to, they're used to seeing a different style of play from my dad than it was for me. And they just grew to love that and accept that because I was good at what I did. Yeah, so they got, they was used to seeing the Simmons, that Simmons jersey just knocking the hell out of people. And when you came, it's like, you know, uh, right. You know, here we go, a little bit more finesse to his game, you know, pick, getting the ball, that type of style, man. Martin County Tigers, okay, uh, so there, um, did you play varsity your first year? Nah, I was JB, and then I got called up to varsity at the end of the year. Okay, were, were y'all pretty good? My first year, we were not, and then my, my sophomore year, we weren't, and then my junior, senior year, we were. All right, cool, cool. Any state, any state championships, playoffs, any of that? Nah, but we was we was a good team. Man, we were always, bro. We would run into, we would run into like, I talked to Pat all the time. We would run into, we ran into like American Heritage. We ran into The Wire. We ran into St. Thomas. The powerhouse is in South Florida, so we, you know, we can never beat them. We didn't recruit. We was a public school. Right, right, right. That's Cheaters. That sounded like my high school career a little bit. Uh, Couple playoff games, but no national, no championships, man. We always used to get like first or second round. I think the the furthest I got was maybe my sophomore year. We played in the dome in the semis, and and we lost. And um, the school who actually beat us uh, ended up winning it all that year. Uh, talking about playing against some tough talent. Um, anybody else from your high school? Uh, uh, go big time. Not from my high school, but we do got a couple guys. Football, the first love, or, or basketball? Because I know you was a, a hell of a basketball player in high school as well. Um, had offers to play Division One basketball as well. Um, so football was the first love, or was it basketball? Basketball, what made you decide to play football at the next level? Uh, I, got, I got better looks at football. And football was more realistic. Like, I was in high school at... Six, six, two, six, three, playing like the four, or even sometimes the five, because I was one of the taller guys on the team, and you know I could jump and do all that stuff. And we had other good players, uh, like smaller, shorter, that played the guard position. Right. But man, basketball all the way. I'm telling you right now, if I, hey, if I chose basketball, I would be in the G League right now. G League, yeah, working on my game, on game. to get to the NBA. But if you if you would have played basketball, then you wouldn't. Wouldn't have been no duo. I know, I know, I know. I'm thankful. God, God showed me the way, man. You know, he showed, he, he, he paved the way. I just had to walk in it, man. Uh, definitely. Um, I mean, obviously, we, I, I think we played basketball one summer, um, but I can definitely see it. And obviously, the way you talk about it in the locker room as well, man, I could tell that was definitely your first love. So, uh, but anyway, I mean, obviously, like you said, God put you in the right place. Made you a Denver Bronco. What other offers did you have as far as college? FIU, Florida International, FAU, Florida Atlantic. Um, and there were a few other schools, but then BC came to a spring game. Um, I did pretty well. The, the coach, actually the guy that came to recruit me, his name was uh, uh, Mike Sarabo, and he worked with uh, Ryan Day. Ryan Day is now the head coach at Ohio State. And uh, they came down, recruited me, and said, hey, it, we're serious about you. If you're serious about us, come up for like a one day camp and we'll offer you. So I was, I took the next flight I could with their one day, went out, uh, you know, had a pretty good day that got the offer and I committed right on the spot. Um, that was heading into my senior year. So I didn't really have like, you know, once you get that first offer, others start trickling in. So like I got, I got an offer from Purdue. I got an offer from, from Illinois, but I never, you know, I committed so early and I was, I, I just stayed committed. It was an East Coast team. I was playing with for the ACC. I was gonna play a lot of East Coast games. Um, my parents would be able to go. I was gonna get a great education. So for me, it was a no brainer. Went for it. That's crazy how it happened, man. You commit somewhere and then out of nowhere, all these other schools wanna offer you, like just wanna swoop in and just try to steal you, man. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Uh, Talking about college now, obviously we're not in college. How you feel about the uh, the NIL deals and being a collegiate athlete and 
back then when we were in college, you know, no NIL deals, right. you know, s scratching and clawing to put some money together to order pizza with the fellas right. and wings, because that in college that's what you survive off of, or you got to eat at the, you know, the the calf or whatever. Um, so how, how do you feel about the NIL deals and, and the guys, you know? making some some real money because some of these guys making some real money it's tough man I, I don't know if i have a definite answer i, I say like anyone that was a, a collegiate athlete and especially if you were you know you were playing um football or you know basketball whatever the case may be like you know for example like when tim tebow's at the university of florida and everyone's wearing 15 jerseys and they're coming to come see him plays winning heismans and this could be said for almost any any player at any university um it's a shame that like the university benefits off so much income from that one player and they don't get a chance to to reap the benefits of of that you know and because you you know you could go on to the nfl and it could not work out and you would have made way more money while you were in college than you did in the league. And so, I, I, so I'm an advocate in that sense, but in the same time, you know, it's so tough because now, I mean, there's already teams like Bama that always, always are separating themselves. They always get the top guys, the top guys, but now that boosters can open up their paychecks and we can get deals done, you know, it's, it's only going to go to certain schools, yeah. the Bamas, the Georgias, you know, the USC's, the, the top dogs are always going to be the top dogs because they'll always have boosters, alumni coming back to be able to get the best players to come to their school. So, it, you know, there, I can see pros and cons on both sides. I just know as a former player, um, and nobody was in the stands wearing my jersey, but as a former player, it's, it is hard to see universities benefit from you giving back to them and you not reaping any of that benefits yourself. What about the college portal? The transfer portal. How you feel about that? I, I may have a lot of people disagree. Me, my, me personally, I'm not a fan of of the transfer portal. I think there should be stipulations, right? Like if your coaching staff comes in, like if the the coaching staff that recruit, recruited you gets canned, yeah. then you should be able to go somewhere, no questions asked, plugged right in. Right. But in my opinion, bro, like, like for example, I'll say, and this is why I say that because my story is about learning the hard way like i came in as a freshman didn't play um or i got thrown into the fire burned my red shirt i had to play my coaching staff got fired that recruited that recruited me coming with a whole new coaching staff so my sophomore year didn't play my junior uh my junior year played but i played terribly in the beginning of the year and then towards the end i started playing better and my uh you know my my defensive coordinator told me I would never amount to playing in the NFL. I wasn't good enough, wasn't smart enough. Damn. Blah, blah, blah. It's crazy coaches talk like that. And and the craziest part is like, <clears throat> I didn't know it at the time, but he was he was basically like trying to trying to bring out another side of me to like see if I really wanted it. To respond. He or to respond. yeah, or if I was gonna just go in the shell and call it quits. So when it had a pretty good senior year. But my point is like, there's adversity that I hit right. and I could have, and if I could have at that time, I would have easily hit the transfer portal and went somewhere else. And who knows if that would have worked out for right. me. So that's what I mean. Like, I'm not an advocate, you know, just cause you don't win the starting job. And there's plenty of stories like that. I, I agree with you on it. Uh, I think it's uh, a gift and a curse for some. Uh, just because like you said, man, it's going to be adversity. I mean, it's college. You know, um, some guys got to sit and, 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 you know, fight through it. You know, uh, I think I seen what Tyron said, you know, he sat behind uh, a couple guys and, you know, obviously, you know, he became the star he was, you know, for LSU. But, you know, sometimes you got to, it's going to be adversity. And, and for me and my, my, how I feel about it, I think, get you ready for the next level and whatever other adversity you're going to go through instead of running, you know, from it. You know, you got to face it. Either you're going to fight your way out of that hole if, if you get, you know, bent or it's a guy in front of you that's, you know, uh, a stud. You know, you got to sit and wait your turn. Gotcha. You know what I mean? But I also see the side of it, you know, um, I think, the, think of the kid, Jameson, Will, Jameson Williams, that, uh, Williams with the, uh, with the, with the uh, Lions. He left Ohio State because he had three first-rounders in front of him. Yeah, yeah. Went to Bama. 
so he can play. I get it in that aspect. Yeah, I get that too. Yeah, if I got four or five first round picks in front of me and them going into, you know, my junior year, all right, in that aspect, I, I can I can agree with that. But um, but just facing adversity, man. You know, you got to learn to deal with it, man. Tell us about your draft process, your expectations, or, you know, how you felt about it. Tell us a little bit about that, that the draft process and how you felt about it. I come at this through multiple angles. So I had a big, like, uh, come to Jesus moment while I was in college. And basically football was an idol in my life. Like, I put football above my relationship with Jesus. I'm not going to say the whole thing, but basically what was happening was I, I was like, God, I'm going to finish out you know, uh, my scholarship, I'm going to get my degree and I'm a, and I'm going to give football up because football has been an idol in my life for so long. And I feel like I owe that to you pretty much. Right. And uh, obviously, you know, God had different plans and I was able to continue to keep playing. But it's because I was I was doing like ultimatums. For, so, for example, I would say like, all right, God, like if, uh, after my senior year, I had a pretty good senior. I said, all right, God. If you want me to continue playing football, then I, you know, I'm gonna need an invite to the combine. And so, bam, invite to the combine came. Then I said, okay, that could have been coincidence. If you want me to continue to keep playing football, and that's your like, that's the path I need to follow. I need to hit these numbers at the combine. Boom, hit pretty much all the numbers exactly. Then, so I'm saying on that because I said my draft uh, grade was gonna be like, like fifth round or later. <clears throat> And I said, okay. And then there was a few speculations that it could go a little earlier. So I, I, I just put it and I, and I shot, I shot my shot. I said, all right, God, if it was meant to be, and you want me to play football, um, I gotta be third round or like third round is it. If it's third, if it's later than the third, then that was just a, I'm gonna obviously go, but that, that to me is a sign that like, it wasn't meant to be. Right. And I was the last pick of the third round. And so Look at God. That to me, that to me was just like we. My my wife calls them God winks, and I kept I kept setting like boundaries, or like I said, I made demands, and he just kept breaking through those barriers, and so, and so for me, that was just like it was me answering his his call for my life and having to walk in that and walk in that with confidence, and so that was kind of like my draft my draft process and what that was like and a little bit more details but that's kind of what it was in a nutshell so you get drafted to the Denver Broncos when you get when you finally get here um it's 2016 yeah so it's a year after the Super Bowl yeah what expectations did you have for yourself as a player like I know a lot of guys come in and I know for me being drafted I had a lot of expectations being thrown at me because I was a first round pick right. and I can, I'll be the first to sit here and admit, man, I, my rookie year, I struggled. Like you're talking about from day one coming in, get thrown in the fire, you the guy. Like they just, uh, they, they just got rid of, you know, their corner who was the guy. He just signed a massive deal with the Atlanta Falcons, Atlanta Falcons, which was uh, Dante Robinson. So yeah, yeah. for me, just uh and you know me i'm a you know i coming out as a junior coming out early i was a you know still a kid and in my mind i'm saying man you know it's still a game you know i'm just going to play football you know so um what are the expectations that you have for yourself you know your rookie year yeah no that's a good question so i, I went in they just won the super bowl for those that remember you know at that time denver's defense was was crazy yeah. they won super bowl 50 yeah they were I mean, they were comparing them to one of the best defenses to play the game. So the no fly zone was there. So they crazy. A lot of guys, Vaughn, you know, um, TJ Ward. Crazy. You know, Tlaib. Crazy. Just to name a few of the guys. You're talking about guys with accolades, real accolades. And so I get drafted and I'm the first. Uh, we went quarterback, D tackle, me, first, second, third. And then so I get drafted. At the first thing I get a text from TJ welcoming me to the team. And then, um, you know, I hit him back, like appreciate it, go out there. And so my expectations, like knowing that they had, like I think TJ had two years left on his deal. Darian Stewart had two years left on his deal. And so for me, expectations was, okay, after the two years is up for, for either one or whoever the case may be, like I gotta be able to retain the info from the last two years with with this squad, right. 
so I can step in and it, it'll be a seamless drop off. Not that I'm the same type of player they are, but the, the level of play will stay the same. Ain't no drop offs, all right. So I, my, my expectation when I came in, like, of course I was gonna push and fight to start. Like that's always the mindset and, expect, and expectation for me, but also knowing my role and embracing that and doing that at the highest level. So my first year with special teams, I came in as a dime. Um, TJ and I would switch sometimes depending on who we were playing that week. And uh, that was my expectation. Then after, after my, my rookie year, year two, I was able to um, have an opportunity to be able to try and start and you know, kind of just ran with it. And I, but I hit some rocky roads too, learning curves, you know, as a young buck, just things you don't know, things you're not bringing in. And I still was learning how to take care of my body. I still was learning how to watch film, you know, properly and what I was taking from it. So it was a lot of learning curves, but that was expectations for me. Right. So when did when did you get to the point uh, in your career where the game slowed down for you and um, you started to kind of process everything you were seeing on the field or things started? And I, I call it, you know, flashing lights. Like, you know, um, for me, you know, seeing things that I watched on film all week, you know, and I recognize it. It's like like a flashing light. That's what I call it. Um, so when did when did you get to that point in your career, after that rookie year and 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 going through a learning curve and and having some some bumps in the road? When did you get to a point where everything kind of slowed down and you started to kind of come into your own as yeah. a player? Yeah, honestly, for me, it was year four where it like really made sense. There was games where I was like. In the end, like before year four, I was in rhythm, I was in my flow, and it just like, it just, it made sense. Like I was just in my rhythm, you know, almost like a quarterback, like dropping back, not feeling pressure in his rhythm, seeing the lanes, hitting the perfect pass. So there was times where I had that in the first couple of, uh, my first couple of years, game to game, but it wasn't consistent. Then year four, our first year, um, my year four for me is our first year playing together. Okay. Um, and it, it really that was, that was four man yeah that was year four for me that is really that's when stuff really for me started clicking and it was a combination of a bunch of different things i had learned for the past three years with guys like you know we just named them tj akib Stu, um and uh then obviously you know vic comes in uh with his defense and we had that you know that that split shell look and when we had to play left and right it made me I had to learn everything because it wasn't just free and strong anymore. Right. Like me and like when I was with Stu, it was free and strong for the most part. Right. But when I was with you, you were saying, now nah, we're going to play left and right. And it forced me to learn the defense at a whole nother level. And that's when I felt confident about what I was doing. So my level of preparation had to be taken to another level. My, uh, my attention to detail had to be taken to another level. So year four for me is kind of when that clicked. Year eight now, yep. uh, a couple Pro Bowls under your belt. All pro under your belt. Talk to me about you know now. What's the ex what what expectations do you have going into the seasons now? Now that you're this you know this elite player, you know um, one of the best safeties in the game. You know what's preparation like now going into a game week? Uh, before we get to that, let's talk about like off season preparation because I I test a lot of things that you know my my seasons and the way that they're gonna go. A lot of that has my off season has everything to do with it, my preparation, because it's just like for me, if I'm equipped and I'm ready and I put in that work in the off season, no matter what I see, camp, OTAs camp and all that stuff, get going into the season, I feel like I'm gonna be ready for it. So what's preparation like for you in the off season and talk about once you get into the season, like what what the preparation looks like to you uh, on a week to week basis as far as recovery and things like that because I mean I know it takes a lot. Yeah, yeah, nah, it definitely takes a lot, man, and it's also part of my journey and process where I'm thankful for. I mean, obviously you, you know, giving you your flowers and helping me with, of course, film and all that stuff, but also like off the field, like what do you do? I mean, year fourteen. So you talking about taking care of your body. I mean, the, the, you played every snap last year, year 13, like the epitome of taking care of your body. So for me, learning from you, learning from the guys I played with prior, you know, before you got here. Um, and in the off season, I, I address it the same way. You know, I think, I think as I've gotten older, I realized that taking time off right after the season is just as important. Let your body heal, let things kind of calm back down. 
but then having your off season be the hardest thing because if you can if you can do that like you said what OTAs training camp regular season whatever you see you already are built for that because you put in the, the callous work kind of months beforehand and so um <clears throat> you know whether that's at XPE down in South Florida with Tony and Matt whether that's out here at uh, Landau's with, with Lauren um you know wherever it is man it's making sure that I'm getting the best the best out of myself in those moments because it's gonna it's gonna make my season that much more successful in terms of staying healthy and things like that so um that's what my off season looks like honestly in a nutshell is is down south in florida training for you know a couple of weeks with them up here in uh, colorado because you got to get used to that altitude before you report back to camp Definitely. and then in season man it's taking that like those that monday tuesday wednesday flow um before like Thursday and Friday start to hit. I mean, I'm attacking massage, chiropractic, uh, MAT, um, ART, uh, dry needling. Uh, I mean, all these things. And obviously the modalities that you could do at the facility, hot tub, cold tub, you got sauna, um, you got the steam room, you got salt tanks. There's so, there's so much that's made available for us and you just take advantage of all of it. And so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I attack that's when I put the bulk of my rehab is at the front of that. Cause if I could feel the better I feel before like Friday, the more fresh I'll feel and, and mentally I'll feel going into the game on Sunday. I know like, you know, man, it, it, it definitely takes a lot. You know, and the thing about it is each game is different. Like some games you might come out and you might feel fine, you know, uh, a little bit of soreness. And then some games you might have a couple collisions in that. Monday and Tuesday, you wake up, you like, my God, I feel like I got hit by a truck. Like, and, and I honestly feel like that today. Um, after playing the Bears, man, they had a couple of heavy running backs and I had a couple of collisions. And I'm just like, man, my neck, shoulders, just like, just, just, just sore, man. And usually that stuff kind of lingers all week until like Thursday or Friday and I finally kind of shake back. But, um, but it definitely takes a lot. For you going into the seasons, I know your preparation, you, we just talked about that. Any goals that you have in mind? Do you go into the season and, base, and saying like, because you three-time All-Pro, yeah. um, Pro Bowl player. I mean, so you go into the season saying, man, if I don't make Pro Bowl or All-Pro, it's not good enough. Is that your mindset going into it after obviously having that, having those pelts on the wall? That's how you go in. That's how, that's how you look at it. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And talking about individually, yeah, like obviously, like I say before the year, like I write it down on my sheet, like first team All Pro, starter in the Pro Bowl, AFC champs, you know, Super Bowl champs. Like that's like, like obviously I had those individual goals, but in due process to that, like I feel like if I'm at my best, our defense is at our best, and that'll that'll just come with it. So to answer your question, of course, like yeah, I go into it, and if I if those if those don't come. And we aren't as successful as a as a defense or as a as a team overall. I feel like I'm letting the team down because I'm not I'm not playing my absolute best ball. You're 100 percent correct. I mean, obviously, looking at it like that, uh, and just just to talk about some of the stuff you've done in your career. I think what four interceptions, at least four interceptions over your last three years. Um, I think what you had six last year, which led the league. Year before that, you had six too, didn't you? I had uh, five the year before. Five the year before that, you had six last year, and you missed six games, right? Or five? Yeah, I missed five games. Man, talking about if you would have played those five, that would have been crazy. How did like? What's your mindset? And I know as competitors, man, I know it's a struggle to not actually be out there with the guys. Like, what's your mindset when you talk about you know obviously having to miss time because everybody go through it. Like, how do you approach it? Like. And I know when I got here, I used to have to kind of talk to you and tell you like, like, man, listen, we got, we got 16, 17 games, man. Like, I mean, if you can't go for one, I mean, you got to get healthy. And I had to learn that too myself. I mean, I had guys that used to be like, look, man, you can't go, you can't go. Yeah. I mean, that's just because, you know, now you're in a situation where putting bad stuff on tape, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, um, Talk about how you feel about that, you know, just just your mindset and how you approach it when you do have to miss time, which you rarely do, because I think from 2019 to 2021, I think you played every snap 
And even up to 19, I think you like, you didn't miss a game or something like that, right? Yeah, no. Then you had a crazy streak going. And when I first got here, you hadn't missed a game in like maybe five or six years. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about, you know, being available, man. That's, that's, that's a rarity in our league, you know, because of the stress and, you know, the physical uh, nature of it, man. So um, what's, what's your mindset when you do have those nicks and, you know, those bruises and things that kind of keep you from being out there with the guys? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough... Uh... It's a tough line to walk, and I'm I'm thankful, bro, because like I told you, man, a lot of anything that has to do with my career and the success that has come with it and and will continue to come with it is all due to the the, the support and cast that I have and the guys that invest into me as a as a husband, as a father, as a son, and as a as a player. So like, yeah, you know, I keep I keep tossing your flowers, but it's it's honestly true, like. Uh, you know, even talking about this last week, like, man, I think, you know, I'm, I'm good, man. I might be able to be like, Jay, Jay, we got time, man. We got time. And just and just that common thought process, like, you got it, bro. You got to be able to trust the guys that you're going to war with. And if anything, you don't want to hurt the team even more by going out there, you know, playing, put, like you said, putting bad tape um, on film and, and, and hurting the team. Ultimately, when we got capable guys to go out there and play some good ball and – and replacement for that. So for me on the sideline, like it's so hard, obviously from a competitive standpoint to sit there and to watch, but um, the team still, the team still needs me to show up somehow, some way. And so whether that's like adjustments on the sideline, something that I'm seeing and maybe um, giving some knowledge back or, or trying to, trying to give a little bit of gain to maybe some of the younger guys that are out there. And uh, it could be encouragement. It could be, uh, restoration in terms of just letting guys know, like, man, c continue to play your game. Like, right. things are going to click for you, bro. Like, don't go out there and try to be anybody but you because you is what got you to this point, no. not play not being anybody else. And um, and obviously still trying to be that 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 leader. So, like, on the, like on the sideline in the Bears game, like, it was multiple times I, f I found myself, like, I felt like our energy was a little low. And so on the sideline, like, even though I'm hurt and I'm, I'm standing there and I'm, I'm watching, I'm trying to cheer you guys on. It's like having a little bit more energy, a little bit more excitement, like clapping obnoxiously, like having that, having that kind of carry over. And I felt like, I felt like the guys that were on the sideline that whether that was practice squad or they also were hurt or whatever the case may be like that, they did that too. And it kind of spread like wildfire. And I'm not saying I started, it was a few guys that did it, but that type of stuff, you know, like you come to the sideline, encourage guys, man, like, man, great tackle, bro. Like hype them up, pump them up. And that positivity is, uh, is super contagious. So things like that is that, you know what I'm saying? That's things like that's what I try and do. It's infectious for sure, man. And, um, and you talked about, and you, you mentioned it, you mentioned being a leader. Uh, and I, and I'm gonna use that to kind of, you know, get on that topic. How do you approach, you know, uh, leadership? You know, um, for people that might be watching, that you know may need some nuggets on leadership. You know, how do you how do you approach it? And like, what are your tactics when it comes to you know trying to get through to your guys? Like you said, you know, a sideline may be a little bit sluggish. Um, you know, what's your, what, what 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 do you do in those situations? Like, how do you get through to your guys? I learn. Um a lot over the years from different leadership styles, right? Like TJ was loud and, and, and boisterous and he knew he knew how to say the, the right things, but say it with a lot of force wow. and a lot of like uh, projectivity to it. And, you know, Stu on the opposite end, he was more of a, I'm a show you type of leader. Right. Um, and so I, I think I think I kind of blended the two and I, I tend to lean more towards like, I'm going to, I'm a show you type of leader. Like, I'm a lead by example type of guy. Like if we need a big play and the play comes my way, like I'm, I'm making it and cause we need it. And I'm a lead in that, I'm a lead by that example. Um, I'm a lead by encouraging. I'm a lead by uh, giving guys like their props and telling them they can do it and, and words of affirmation and things like that. But in the same breath, like I do have this side of me when when stuff ain't right and it's not sitting right, it just, it, just, it, it kind of like boils in just like in inside it just i just get this boiling feeling and i i gotta i gotta say something it ain't right i gotta say something and so there's times there's times where you have like tough conversations and it ain't it ain't really 
it, it ain't really an excuse my language. It ain't really like bitching at guys. It's more, it's more of calling them higher. Like, bro, you're you're way better than this. Like, what are we doing? I'm way better than this. Like, trying to get the best out of them. And and that's that's what it comes down to. And um, I mean, we see that all the time. You talk about leadership. You know, you obviously look at what Kobe's done and Jordan. And there's plenty of guys that uh, Bron. There's plenty of guys around NBA, NFL, whatever the case may be, who lead well and they they know how to get the best out of their group yeah. and i think I, that's what like at the end of the day that's all i care about is how can i get the best out of my group and out of myself and what do i have to do to get that so sometimes i got to be that guy that that may be an asshole, and then sometimes i got to be the guy that's encouraging and letting them know they're doing the right things and a lot of that i learned from you tj Stu, like all the guys that i played with over the years all right nice nice any pre-game rituals like things you gotta do before the game just you know are you superstitious nah but y'all y'all have started to make me superstitious the whole db group how how because man like when we go out for dinner on thursdays i'm like man my steak last week was good like let's hit that spot again like nah we can't we lost we lost <laughs> yeah you gotta burn it man you gotta hit it so y'all make me superstitious. Lose, you gotta, we gotta burn that restaurant, man. We can't go there no more this year. Uh, we can't go into the next season. We gotta try again next season, man. So the first three weeks, man, hey, whatever restaurant we went to, we sorry, we ain't coming back. I'm telling you that right now. I'm telling you that right now, man, we sorry. Uh, won't be back till after the season, man. But, uh, and to be honest, like you, you saying you're not superstitious. Uh, I like to say I'm not, but I think I mean I think I am. Ah, uh, you are. I ain't gonna get into the specifics on you are you are. I ain't gonna say very super. I seem very superstitious. I mean like, but you're not very super. But you definitely got your stuff where it's like. Yeah, I do for sure. Cause it's like, and I might been I've been doing this my entire career. Like it's a couple songs I gotta listen to before I actually get into a, a playlist where I can just really float through it and. Mm -hmm go from song to song, man. It's a couple songs I gotta hear. Like, and then right before we go out, it's three more songs that I gotta hear. And it's like... I'm superstitious about that now too. I gotta hear them three songs before we go out. Them three songs is like, all right, do I put my right sock on first and I put my left sock on? I'm like, we won last week, all right, I'm gonna put my left sock back on first again. You know what I mean? Like, Superstition. You know, do I put this cleat on first? But I'm like, we lost last week. I did the right. Let's try the left this week, man. But then, and then in my mind, I'm like, I ain't superstitious. But then it's like I'm watching TV and I'm like, I gotta put it on a uh, the volume on a on an even number. And this is like, and I keep telling myself I'm not superstitious, but yeah, I'm crazy. Yeah, you got your own rituals, bro. Yeah, it's I don't know, man. It I think it kind of started in college, man. Like one game, I um playing out of freshman, man, and a couple songs, and then I'm like, well. I played good, gotta play him again. Gotta, gotta keep going with it, gotta keep going with it, man. Uh, the only thing I'll say I think I might be superstitious in is I don't have a set, like, I, li I, listen, I tend to listen to some of the same songs. I have like a genre of the year that, whatever. But, I, but the whole car ride from, like we playing a home game or on the bus ride to an away game, the whole car ride over, I gotta listen to R and B because if I get too hyped too early, I I burn my energy, and so I gotta be like, I gotta be chilling. So I gotta be listening to some chill music before I go into the locker room. So you're the chill, the chill guy, like, and I know I'm the complete opposite, like, and in the locker room, you're the chill guy, and obviously the fans don't know it. Like, you're a guy that doesn't go out to warm up. And obviously I'm the I'm the total opposite. Like I'm probably gonna be the loudest one in the locker room. I'm joking. Which I think me being that way kinda makes everybody else kinda like, mm -hmm. you know, kinda mellow out and chill. But I'm I, I just always been that guy. And you say it all the time, man, you don't take nothing serious and it's just like I can't help it. It's like <laughs> I gotta enjoy it, man. I gotta enjoy myself, man. And it's it's like I'm I'm laughing, I'm cracking jokes, and I don't lock in until either we're out first on defense and I run out down the field, that's when I like lock in. Man, but the thing about that is like 
So I am more chill, but when you're in there joking around all that stuff, like I always join in because yeah, that's I say, yeah, you definitely, you definitely a part of it. Like because I think it speaks to your 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 preparation and your testament to feeling ready for the game. Like I'm not saying it gotta be everybody. Some people gotta be in killer mode yeah. the whole time. Yeah. But I but I think like, and at least this is how I see it. I'm so prepared and I feel so prepared. That man, I, what is there to be in here like? Exactly, and that's yeah, and that's my thing. And I'm in my mind, I'm like, man, I didn't watch so much film. I didn't prepare. I had good practice all week. Like, hey, it don't matter what they do. Like, I'm gonna be prepared. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm a joke. I'm gonna do all that because I feel like, like you said, you're you're usually uptight when you're not prepared. Yeah, I know I'm prepared. Like I put the work in all week. So I'm gonna be in there joking. Got guys coming in with some wild outfits on. I'm going to, you know. Let them know. Like, yeah, I'm going to let them know. Like, it's going to be, I'm going to have I'm gonna have a full-out comedy session right in this locker room. And the coaches, depending on who your coach is, you know, some coaches could like it and some coaches may not like it. But that's just who I am. Like, I I got a, I got a joke. I got, I can't be serious. And I, I'll never forget, I was in high school basketball, playing basketball. We were on the team bus. And um, this might have been my senior year. And... Loudest one on the bus, cracking jokes. We on there rapping, all kind of stuff. And we go out and we get blew out. And the next day, the next day my coach called me in his office and closed the door, he sit down. He said, listen, everybody can't do that like you do. Like you, everybody can't just turn it on like you do. Like, so you gotta stop doing that on the bus. And in my mind, I'm like, what I do? <laughs> he blaming you for the loss. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> he 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 wasn't necessarily blaming me, but he was just like basically saying like certain guys got to lock in. And obviously in high school, you're still trying to figure out what type of guy you are in the, in the sense of like getting ready and stuff like that. I mean, you, you're a kid. So and for me, I'm like, man, shoot, I'm a joke. I'm doing all this and that. And I never forget we got soon as we got there. We, as soon as we pulled up to the school, I'm talking about I had I done put on a show all the way to the game. It's about an hour drive, hour yeah. 15 drive. As soon as we part, he said, y'all better not lose. We got blew out. Man, we chill, man. You we, maybe spit my drink out. We might have got hit by 40. <laughs> we got blew out. I'm talking about they were dunking left and right, and I'm in that thing like this. And Still joking, too, on the side. Like, I know you are, man. I'm joking, like. I'm joking. Man, he called me in the office the next day and he was just like, man, listen, man, you got to stop doing that on the bus. I'm like, man, you want me to be sitting on here uptight? Then you're going to be like, damn, what's wrong with him? But um, that's just that's just how I am, man. That's my preparation, man. I, I got to enjoy it, man. Let's talk about Walter Payton Man of the Year. Mm -hmm. Nominated three times, three years in a row, actually, for... Uh, for the Broncos, our team here in the city. Um, I mean, obviously, it's amazing what you do for the city off the field, man. For those that don't know, um, kind of give us a rundown uh, on your philanthropy work. You know your foundation. I think uh, I think most guys would tell you um, who are Walter Payton nominees or or even that do community work in general. I mean, like yourself, like you never do it for the public gratification of being noticed that you're giving back thinking a lot of a lot of times you know guys do that just to show the younger generation like hey man with this platform you know look how giving back can can lead others to success just by playing football right, right? so for me that's always my mindset man is is this platform's temporary um, i'm blessed to be in year eight and uh, who knows how many more years God has in store for me, but each year I'm gonna make sure I take at full advantage of giving back and continuing to give back because I was once that kid that benefited from uh, a football camp, you know, a basketball camp that an NFL, NBA player put on. And uh, I can't, can't necessarily say it directly led me to where I am today, but I know it definitely helped a lot. And um, and those are the little interactions. So that's why with my foundation, man, the Justice Simmons Foundation, um, my, that my wife and I started, um, we we just always want to make sure that we're giving kids an equal opportunity and equal chance at life to achieve to achieve their dreams and aspirations. 
And uh, a lot of kids don't have that. So whether that's through empowerment, whether that's through education, whether that's through sports, um, we want to make sure that we're giving them a platform or the ability to elevate their platform so that they can reach their goals and uh, and kind of bring them up, uh, you know, along their journey of life. And that's really we just want to be a, a, a helping hand. That's really all it is, man. So it's just been a blessing to be able to do that. That's dope, man. And I'm sure, um, you know, all the places that you, you know, reach out and touch um, where you do your work, uh, where you work at. Um, I'm sure they all appreciate it, man. Um, as well as the guys in the locker room. I know I appreciate it as well, man. You, the events you put on and stuff like that, man. None of that stuff goes unnoticed, man. So, um, but now nah, that's amazing for sure. As well as in Martin County in Florida, uh, putting on an annual camp for the kids. Uh, I know me and you collabed on a camp here in, um, in Denver. Um, and obviously looking forward to doing something else like that this year. Um, your foundation and my foundation, you know, just doing stuff, man, and it, because that's what it's about, man. Obviously, having this platform and being able to give back to kids, and for me, mine is um, obviously the Kareem Jackson Foundation works a lot with uh, women with breast cancer and and kids with pediatric cancer. Um, so, I mean, like I said, man, I appreciate you doing that stuff, and I'm sure, you know, the kids as well. You know, appreciate all those kids you're touching. Let's talk about your, your your inspiration for it all, man. Who who who's the driving force that inspires you? Yeah, my my biggest inspiration has and always will be my dad, man. He he just helped me learn so much about myself when I was young, and um, I'm so thankful, bro, because just through the years and and through different locker rooms and and having different conversations with guys, I. You know, there's so many guys that didn't have a relationship with their dad or didn't know their dad. And my dad was always present when he didn't have to be and always fought to be present when he didn't have to be. And um, he'll always be my inspiration, man. God, God rest his soul. You know, he passed this this past year, you know, fighting his battle with cancer. And, you know, that was really tough. But I'm just I'm just so thankful f for me that it that at least it happened in a time frame where I feel secure with who I am and what I'm doing and how I'm doing it because of how he led our family and how he kind of raised me to be able to lead uh, my family. And so um, he'll always be my inspiration, man. That's my guy. But man, Jay, man, I appreciate you, man. Uh, obviously, it's an honor to always, you know, have you on KJAC TV, but this one's special, man, because this is the first one, you know, the first from the basement the new platform, man, and the way we want to do things here now moving forward, man. So I always love, man. Appreciate Doggy. having you, man. And, You're and the realest, sharing some man. vino with me, man. man. Hey, man. Hey, to the, the first episode of KJAC TV, man. To the first episode. You're the realest, bro. Appreciate hey. you. Hey, I hope y'all enjoyed this one, man. And we out.